Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we've been doing and the composition of C3 and um, give you a general sort of overview. Um, so Committee 3 is concerned with the protection of persons and unborn children when ionizing radiation is used in medical diagnosis, therapy and research. But uh, with the demise of uh, Committee 5, we've also taken the role to uh, do protection in veterinary medicine. So the sorts of things we do are evaluate radiation protection needs for emerging technologies. We produce recommendations and user-friendly guidance to try and help um, the, the users in uh, the medical field. And we have uh, relations um, with um, well, several organizations, but two in particular um, we have speci specific agreements with, and we usually have representatives of the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency who attend the meetings of Committee 3. Now, this shows the uh, group um, as it was um, in, uh, for the last session. Um, uh, Alicio Vanio um, from Spain has uh, led the group and been instrumental in driving forward the production of quite a lot of reports over the, uh, the last eight years. Um, but we've had quite a big turnaround um, for this next session. So in fact, we've got eight new members. So we've only got seven of the uh, members who served last time, but we've got eight new members from a wide range of countries. Um, from well, 12 different countries, and uh, if you count uh, our uh, secretary, Madame Rahan, is linked to India, then 13 countries. So we've got a wide representation uh, from across the globe. So we have been, uh, we've produced quite a lot of uh, reports because we try and produce focused reports that are going to be helpful to the users. Um, so we try and gear reports to particular specialties. So just going through some of those that we've prepared over the last five years, we've looked at radiological protection in cardiology, in pediatric diagnostic and interventional radiology. We've prepared one uh, on ion beam radiotherapy with uh, uh, proton uh, and carbon ion, uh, carbon ion therapy. Um, we've prepared ones on the radiation dose to patients from radiopharmaceuticals. These are sort of ongoing uh, ones where we get, gather information with Committee 2 or produced by Committee 2 um, to uh, assist in ass assessments of doses. And then we produced one on uh, radiation protection in cone beam computed tomography, a, a new technique which is getting more and more widely used. Well, I'm going to talk mainly uh, today about the publication which uh, we've just completed. Um, so the proofs have now been checked and this will be going out, uh, to, uh, for, or actually published, uh, towards the end of the year. So diagnostic reference levels, we've been uh, using them for quite a long time. We don't have dose limits in medicine. We have these reference, or reference levels. And um, we, we're going to talk about the conducting of surveys to establish DRLs. Uh, things have changed in the amount of data and the way we collect patient dose data. So we're going to talk about electric, electronic collection, which has increased the amount of data and enable us to take more sort of action in um, keeping uh, procedures optimized. We talk about all the, uh, the specific modalities. We've got a chapter on pediatrics because that's a particular challenge with the wide range of sizes of uh, patients. Um, so we divide them into different weight ranges. And we talk about the use of DRLs in clinical practice and how they can be used in optimization. We're saying a few things about the different points. Um, the quantities used for diagnostic reference levels, they should assess the amount of radiation to perform the imaging examination, but there must be something that's easily measured or determined. So not something which involves a lot of uh, approximation but something which is actually physically measured. The DRL values, we say, should be based on surveys of DRL quantities 
uh, for appropriate groups of patients. So not, not phantoms. So we carry out in our hospital surveys of these, those quantities for uh, particular examinations. Um, then we take the median value and uh, for a particular hospital, we'll send that off to some sort of national collation organization. And then from the collation of all those median values, uh, we will get a distribution of doses in hospitals around a particular country or region. And so we then select the 75th percentile so that three quarters of the hospitals are below that diagnostic reference level and one quarter above. So it's really a way of um, we're using the practice as it is, um, which radiologists have images which they think they um, take as diagnostic. Um, and so we're using their expertise to provide us with information on the dose levels that you need to obtain those examinations. Um, so we recommend that the national or, or regional DRLs are revised every three to five years. And that the uh, reason for this is that they're dependent on the state of practice. So if we get new equipment, new techniques in, we need to constantly keep revising. One um, thing which some people have done in the past, which we strongly uh, say must not be done, is it's not a comparison for individual patients or individual examinations. It's difficult getting DRLs for interventional procedures because of the complexity, so, but we've suggested various ways that might be used to overcome this. And we then, um, having established a DRL value in a country, would carry out surveys and hospitals would again calculate their median doses for particular examinations and compare them with this DRL value. So we, uh, that DRL value is then considered to be consistently exceeded when the, the local median for a representative sample is greater than the DRL value. So we're just taking the simple case that consistently means in the majority of cases. And then we stress the final step, comparison of local practices to DRL values, that's not sufficient if you don't do anything with that value. So if a local or national DRL value is exceeded, then you need to investigate, need to take corrective action. That's what optimization is all about. So we've tried to give guidance on how that process is done and stress the need to follow it up. So that's the, 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 our next report. There's a few others on the way. Um, there's increasing number of uh, fluoroscopy examinations carried out, uh, both interventional procedures in cardiology and, inter and radiology, but also uh, in other medical specialists, specialities outside the imaging department. So we're trying to provide advice on protection for those involved. Um, so we've looked at occupational exposures and uh, reported radiation injuries because there's been a lot of evidence in recent years of uh, uh, lens opacities from uh, among interventional clinicians. We've looked at the issues of dose monitoring, we've looked at methods of protecting the eyes and the head and the, the thyroid. Um, we look at the characteristics of the protection devices, uh, good quality control and possibly most important education and training of clinicians. In the, in the techniques. So that um, report uh, has been approved with a few amendments by the main commission, so should be out, I think, early next year. And we have another one which uh, is approaching the final stages, radiological protection therapy with radiopharmaceuticals. Um, this is about to go out for a public consultation once a, a few revisions have been made. Um, and this is about the justification and optimization of treatment methods. So um, more information about the actual bi uh, uh, analysis of the biokinetic data to try and um, fit the dose more to the patient. So it's, there's lots of information on the methods of absorbed dose calculations and protection issues also associated with radiopharmaceutical therapy. Now, we 
as well as producing the reports or publications, we also try and take the information in those reports and produce uh, educational slides, which are also available through the uh, ICRP website. And so we've got um, sets of educational slides on uh, a whole range of different reports that we've produced in the past and ones that we uh, have, have just recently produced. At the moment, the committee is working on the radiation dose to patients from radiopharmaceuticals. This is an ongoing process um, in, in task group 36 with committee two. So this is a sort of continual update um, as more uh, dose information um, and more dose calculations have been carried out. Uh, we have collaborated with the other committees in the use of effective dose because this we've found particularly useful in medicine as it does provide a single quantity that we can relate in some way to health detriment. Um, we, we don't want to be calculating risk, we just want some quantity that we can use and that effective dose has provided with us with a useful one to use over the years. We've got other groups working on occupational radiological protection in brachytherapy, uh, radiological protection in medicine in relation to individual responses because if well, we know that individuals have different responses to radiation, the different degrees of radiosensitivity. And so this, uh, once we get more information on that, that's going to have a major implication for medicine because we treat and we diagnose a, a vast range of people um, and some, uh, so it could considerably modify our practices. And because we want to communicate uh, radiation protection methods and ideas and risks uh, to uh, healthcare providers and the public, um, we've also been producing a sort of web-based system which will be incorporated into ICR. That's the, going to be electronic education um, system of, from ICRP. So we're looking at, um, we're always looking at, at new topics, um, and these are just a selection. So we're looking at a possible framework for optimization uh, in medical imaging, gearing uh, the optimization process to the individual patient. We're looking at radiological protection aspects of, of daily imaging and radiotherapy. Um, we considering further whether we need to do anything else relating to protection of the eye lens and the cardiovascular system. Um, we've uh, been discussing overexposures and unintended exposures in diagnostic and interventional procedures. And um, I've been collaborating um, on, through an IEA technical meeting. And so we've been collaborating with the IEA and actually produced uh, guidance in the form of a paper in general of radiological protection, which uh, um, in fact has just been published on the internet. Um, we're looking at uh, other things which we, we need to consider. We're not going to necessarily prepare reports, but not at, at this stage, but the use of ionizing radiation for assessment of body composition linked to sporting uh, performance. So that's nothing related to uh, medical diagnosis but it is an application and it's one that uh, in certain countries um, is being used quite extensively and in others um, it's uh, prohibited. And in the UK we've just been producing guidance um, of a, about a recommended approach to that. We looked at improving patient dosimetry and protection in high dose procedures, uh, particularly interventional CT, um, and we're, we'll also be collaborating with other committees, uh, C4 in particular, in radiation protection in veterinary medicine. And there are other topics relating to optimization that uh, we are quite interested in and we want to follow up further. So ICRP uh, Committee 3, we're ready um, to work on topics um, that the medical and other scientific uh, societies and communities want. So if you have any topics that uh, uh, you think that we ought to consider, then you can um, 
pass them on to Kimberly and myself, and then we'll see whether we want to take them forward. So we want to collaborate with other international and national organisations in the development of guidance, and we welcome any suggestions of other areas. Um, and I think that's all I want to say, so thank you very much.